Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In his sermon number nine, Joseph Butler, towards the end, is going to try to shift our perspective on anger and resentment and forgiveness and love of enemies into an explicitly Christian context that, that is one informed by scripture and thinking about things in terms of the human being's relation to God. Not exclusively, of course, as we're going to see, but certainly you could say predominantly. And the first thing that we should look at is where he uses Jesus Christ as an example and a, a very extreme example. Christ is on the cross being crucified and says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And what does Butler take this to emblemize or signify for us? Forgiveness and a forgiveness that is extraordinarily vast. Those who are killing God, God's self uh, what, or himself uh, are being asked to be forgiven by the, the one who is suffering. And he says that though injury, injustice, oppression, the baseness of ingratitude are the natural objects of indignation or if you please of resentment, they are likewise the objects of compassion. And so Christ is like the primary example of that. But he's saying that we can do that too. How can we do that? Well, we can look at the people who are engaging in these offenses that he just rattled off and say, yes, those are bad to other people. They shouldn't be doing them, but they are even more damaging to the wrongdoers themselves. He says, no one ever did a designed injury to another, a designed injury, one that is intentional. But at the same time, he did a much greater to himself. If therefore we could consider things justly, such a person is, according to the natural course of, of our affections, an object of compassion as well as displeasure. Doesn't mean that we can't look at them and be like, Damn, that person really shouldn't behave that way. But we can also say, oh, that poor, miserable bastard thinking that is a good way for them to behave. And so this is why he brings up Christ on the cross saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. If they didn't know what they were doing, they wouldn't be doing the bad things that they are doing. And so we can show compassion. He also tells us something very interesting here. I think this is a, a very suggestive idea. He says, the offenses which we are all guilty of against God and the injuries which men do to each other are often mentioned together. And what he means here is that in scriptural passages, whether in you know the Jewish scriptures or in the Christian uh, New Testament, these are often being brought up in relation to each other, often in the same line or set of lines. What's going on there? Why is there a connection between our own misdeeds towards God and what it is that we dumb human beings do to each other? Well, he goes on and he says, making allowance for the infinite distance between the majesty of heaven and a frail mortal, and likewise for this, that he cannot possibly be affected or moved as we are. That's God, right? Offenses committed by others against ourselves and the manner in which we are apt to be affected with them give a real occasion for 
calling to our mind our own sins against God. Now, you know, God doesn't, according to Butler, get angry with us in the same way that we get ticked off with other people. But if we think about how other people do things to us and the anger that we feel, we could be like, oh, man, I let God down all the time. I'm, I'm not a good person in the respect that I often pretend to be. And he says that um, this is a very important point. There is an app- apprehension and presentiment natural to mankind that we ourselves shall at one time or another be dealt with as we deal with others. And then he talks about the, this peculiar acquiescence in and feeling of the equity and justice of this equal distribution. So what's he getting at there? When we think about our own viewpoints, our own attitudes, our own responses to people wronging us and the anger that we feel, and then whether we actually continue to exhibit benevolence, love, you know, forgiveness, mercy, compassion towards them, or whether we push that aside, we are saying this is the way that that people should behave. We're also saying God should behave that way to us. God will behave that way to us. That's actually one of the things that gets stressed in scriptures. We will be dealt with as we dealt with others. And so he brings up some biblical passages. He talks about the book of Sirach, a deuterocanonical work uh, written by, you know, Sirach in Alexandria. Um, He says, he that revenges shall find vengeance from the Lord, and he will surely keep his sins in remembrance. Forgive your neighbor the hurt he's done to you so that your sins also will be forgiven when you pray. One man bears hatred against another and he seeks pardon from the Lord. He shows no mercy to a man who is like himself and he asks forgiveness for his own sins. So he's saying there, and this is, you know, a, a uh, earlier Christian, uh, not Christian, uh, uh, Jewish text that gets used by Christians. It's often called Ecclesiasticus because it was read so often in the Ecclesia, in the churches. If you want to be forgiven by God, You better be forgiving to other people because otherwise God is going to treat you the same way that you're treating other people. Um, He goes on and he says, um, let anyone read our Savior's parable of the king who took account of his servants. This is in Matthew, right? And the equity and lightness of the sentence which was passed on him who is unmerciful to his fellow servant will be felt. What is he referencing there? So, you know, there, there's uh, a person who is in debt and, uh, and then he goes to another servant and he's like, give me my money, right? And well, if you act that way, if you don't forgive other people their debts, your debts are not going to be forgiven either. That's, that's a bit of a problem there. So he says, there is somewhat in human nature which accords to and falls with that method of determination. So let's place before our eyes the time which is represented in the parable. What is being talked about there? He says, our own death, the final judgment. So we can imagine ourselves being judged by God. And if you do that and you're being honest with yourself, well, you know, if you're a forgiving person, he says that could actually be, you know, quite a positive experience for you. He says, um, a good man in the same circumstance in the last part and close of his life, conscious of many frailties as the best are, but conscious too that he had been meek, forgiving and merciful, that he had in simplicity of heart been ready to pass over offenses against himself. Having felt this good spirit will give him not only a full view of the amiableness, the lovableness of it, but the surest hope that he will meet with it in his judge. So if you are a forgiving person, if you do let things slide, if you do get angry, but don't sin because of that anger, you can expect that you are going to be treated likewise by God, who's going to say, well, you screwed up a good bit, but we'll let it pass. What if you're not like that? What if you're a grudge holder? What if you're a person who counts up the offenses of others. He says, 
Suppose yourself under the apprehensions of, of, of approaching death, that you were just going to appear naked and without disguise. Now that naked and without disguise, so you can't conceal anything from the just judge. All the lies that you told other people that you half believe in yourself, you're not going to have those to hide behind anymore. All the excuses that you've made, all of the, you know, prioritizing, preferencing yourself, saying, oh, it's okay for me, that's not going to slide. What happens then, he says, um, if you have to give an account of your behavior towards your fellow creatures, could anything raise more dreadful apprehensions of that judgment than this? The reflection that you had been implacable, that is, unappeasable, unable to be made peaceful, and without mercy towards those who defended you, without that forgiving spirit towards others, which that it may now be exercised towards yourself is your only hope. I mean, you better hope that God is more merciful than you because if you're the model and God is going to treat you the way that you treated others, you're screwed. So, you know, those are some considerations. He says, um, if you forgive men your, their trespasses, your heavenly father will likewise forgive you. And he says, so that we might have a constant sense of it on our mind, the condition is expressed in our daily prayer. What is he talking about? The Our Father, where you say, forgive us our trespasses. And then how does the line go? As we forgive those who trespass against us. That as we, pretty important there. What if you don't forgive those who trespass against you? Well, when you ask, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against you, you're in effect saying, don't forgive my trespasses because I don't forgive anybody else, right? You're, that's the as that is being preserved there. So if we reflect on this, according to, you know, Joseph Butler, this will put some things into perspective about the commands to forgive injuries and love enemies. We're not being commanded to do anything that's beyond our capacities. And it's a way of like participating within, you could say, an economy in which forgiveness is distributed to us just as much as we distribute it to other people, or actually even more, because God puts up with more of our BS than we put up of other people's BS, according to Butler. And so he says, a forgiving spirit is therefore absolutely necessary as ever we hope for pardon of our own sins, as ever we hope for peace of mind in our dying moments, or for the divine mercy at the day when we shall most stand in need of it. And this is how he ends his Sermon 9 with these reflections, offering them to his audience and to us, his readers.